pod itself was designed under a, a Defence Innovation Hub project um, as a JTAC training solution and uh, it was driven by Air Force's requirement to have some kind of um, system that would support the MOU training uh, with the US requirements. And so Tony and the team designed this pod and, uh, and have been developing and building it over the last three years. And uh, here it is, almost ready to be delivered as a, as a finished product. And we'll be doing some more tests and evaluation in, in the coming months on this aircraft. Its primary purpose is, is as I said, the JTAC training system. And, and, and what that requires is a visual picture being able to, to uh, transmit to the ground to a, a rover pod or an ATAC pod or a uh, tablet that uh, a JTAC might have. Um, to train them how to do their job in the theatre. It also needs a bunch of radios so that they can actually talk the talk and, uh, and be able to talk to other fighters or other uh, assets. It has Link 16 in there. It has um, a range of secure voice data and, and video um, capability. It has a couple of other little quirky things. One of the design requirements was that it wasn't integrated into the engineering of the aircraft. It didn't touch the aeroplane other than being hung on a wing. And that's one of the, the critical events of, or critical parts of this design. It is self-sufficient, it has its own power support source, it has its own GPS signal, and it doesn't need to be integrated into the aeroplane at all. Um, it just needs to be certified to be carried on the wing. It talks uh, by Bluetooth to the cockpit or to the cabin uh, where the operator does their thing. He also talks via encrypted uh, data link to the ground and can be controlled from the ground. So a JTAC, JTAC instructor on the ground could control what the pod is looking at and how it's behaving. It has a number of other features. It has a laser pointer and a laser designator. Um, it has Link 16, as I mentioned. So it has all those top end things that the JTAC needs to learn how to use. And that was the design uh, criteria for the pod, and that's what we've come to. We've recently been uh, awarded a, a grant by the New South Wales government to see how it would inter interact with the, um, the rural firefighting services whether we could put a picture into a truck, for instance, um, in, in live video, which would ex be extremely useful, as we know, from the 2020 fires. And we're pretty excited about that. That then could take us on to other things. We could integrate uh, synthetic aperture array radar. That would then give us coastal surveillance. That would give us uh, tracking of targets. That would give us search and rescue. That would all sorts of things we could do. We see the possibility going beyond training into operational effect, both military and civil. But particularly in the training environment, it's a very low cost and very low integration cost um, um, solution. And uh, that's going to keep us busy for a while. One of the frustrations in the 2020 fires, I was scanning those fires at night up in the Learjet at 30,000 feet and we'd do the whole of New South Wales in, in one or two missions. And the frustrating part of that was we'd take imagery that would then be converted into something useful and then presented a briefing about four to five hours later. And in four to five hours, that fire would have moved maybe 100, 120 kilometres, maybe even more. And uh, that wasn't very useful. And some of the disasters in the 2020 fires were about firefighters getting stuck on a ridge line uh, with nowhere to go. Um, houses not been evacuated because they couldn't see the fire coming. The utility of a pod like this is that we can communicate the information live to the ground um, right down to a tablet size. So we can put that in any truck in the hands of any firefighter quite easily and if they're about a 20 or 25 mile radius of where the aircraft is at, we could even give them control of the pod and say you look at what you want to look at and make your decisions based on there. Now that needs to integrate obviously into command and control and that's for the, uh, the, the user environments to work out how to do it but the opportunity to exploit that live imagery that can be controlled from the ground is, is really important. And I think that's got an enormous ca um, capacity to help um, in, the, in the civil disaster management point of view. We were looking for an aircraft that was cheaper to operate than, say, a Learjet, because we'd been uh, successfully flying the pod on the Learjet, and we needed access to something that, that we could control. So um, the, uh, the, the CEO, Tony, went out and bought himself uh, an aircraft that had hard points. And the only one we could find in Australia was this O2. So we end up with this aircraft. It just so happens this aircraft has a bit of interesting history. It was a Vietnam vet. It flew in 1967, 68, uh, and beyond through to 72 in, uh, in the US forces as a forward air controlled aircraft. It's got some battle damage. Um, it's got some really interesting stories about a one uh, 7.62 round coming through the floor and lodging in the, in the pilot's checklist. Uh, I've always stressed as a, fly, as a flying instructor that checklists are really important and there's another reason why. But it actually is quite ironic that we've got a Vietnam vet, a 1967 aeroplane, matched with 2022-2023 innovation um, and, uh, and that's, that's a really unique combination. It's inexpensive to operate, it's easy to fly, um, it's easy to maintain, it's accessible. So from our point of view, it, it carries the right amount, it's the perfect solution.